Uh, th so thank you very much for that warm um, introduction and I'm so thrilled that Moritz had the idea of translating this book into Dutch because um, it's about recent events, uh, the run-up to the Paris Climate Summit as you've heard. And I wrote it because around the end of 2014 it started to occur to me that we were actually beginning to win what I think of as the carbon war. And having worked on climate change for 25 years, I've become very used to the idea that, you know, this is a great way to bash your head against a brick wall and, you know, be defeated in one battle after the other. Uh, but around that time, I, I thought the pendulum was swinging. And so I thought what I'll, I'll do is I'll, I'll do a sort of diary from the front lines that people might find interesting because we, we are all told that human beings like a linear narrative story, a story that you know, is true, as, at least as, as far as I experience it, but a story that I could recount because, you know, um, I'm a, basically I'm a kind of bit part player. I'm not an important player in any way in the great dramas that are unfolding uh, around us. But I am enough of a bit part player that I get into some of these places to see the dramas unfolding. And that's what I thought I would, I would do. And so I started writing um, in the beginning of 2015. And as you heard, published one episode every month and building up to the summit with the intention of finishing the whole thing on the last night of the, the Paris summit. But I thought what might be interesting for you for 20 minutes or so would be to just go through the main storylines in this great saga that I've had the privilege of, uh, of watching, um, but also just give a flavor for what has happened in the different storylines um, subsequently uh, through to the present day. So it's just a flavor of all the multiple dramas that make this um, epic story that we're living through um, and I've divided them into ten uh, the top ten stories so these are all related to each other but they interweave in really interesting ways across the narrative arc of this history that we're all living through um, and experiencing so the ten are um, a story of policymakers getting serious about climate change in the 25 years I've worked on that this hasn't happened, but a critical mass, not all of them of course, but a critical mass have started that. At the same time, strengthening them, civil society is awakening in a way um, that we haven't seen before. Again, not in total, but in critical mass, enough mass to shift things. This one is very important. Number three, regulators are beginning to regulate climate risk. This hasn't happened until last year. In fact, it hadn't even started happening really at the time that I, I started writing the book. At the same time, overlaying it all, as we've heard from many speakers at this wonderful event today, disruption is moving very fast in clean energy technologies, so fast that utilities are racing to escape a death spiral, what they themselves call a death spiral. At the same time, as capital is beginning to be withdrawn, from the incumbency interests in the divestment movement, a snowballing effect of divestment. And even for those who stay invested, they're increasingly squeezing incumbency spending. In America, the so-called shale boom uh, is going bust in front of our eyes, large parts of it. This is a drama that is quite remarkable as it, as it unfolds. Uh, so much so that the wider oil and gas industry is itself facing talk of the end of the road, of twilight, um, in places it could never have imagined just recently seeing such thoughts expressed. And finally, the legal system is fast becoming a driver behind it all. So these are the ten stories, and I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes on each one sort of giving a flavor uh, as to why I've become a cautious optimist, having been until about a year ago uh, actually pretty much of a pessimist that we would ever do anything other than bash our heads against brick walls. So let's start with policymakers. 
Go back to June 2015, front page of the Financial Times after the G7 summit that year in Germany. And this is Chancellor Merkel, President Hollande and President Obama, you know, deciding that something is going to be done in Paris, dragging the other four along with them. And this is where we first heard talk of fossil fuel phase out within the century. And that's what the science requires, of course, sooner rather than later. And in the, in the summer, summit summary, they talk about up to 70% cuts by 2050. Not enough, but certainly getting there just 35 years from now. So going into the summit, there were three possible outcomes. We could have a repeat of Copenhagen, no signal. We could have a clear signal. Uh, most people thought that wouldn't happen. Uh, most of us thought there'd be some kind of halfway house as an outcome of the summit. But what we got um, was actually the clearest signal, a far clearer signal than um, most people at the summit ever imagined possible. So this is hugely significant, I argue in the book, for three main reasons. The stakes, we all know how grave they are. The Pope reminded us of them on the eve of the summit. We are at the limits of suicide, he said. Bang on. Scale, um, this was a treaty adopted by every independent nation on the planet. They were all there, every single one. And they signed up to something that has teeth. The scope of the treaty is very important. There are four crucial themes here. First of all, the goal that we've heard about a lot today. Two degrees, if we can get there, um, two and a, one and a half degrees. And that, very clearly captured in the treaty, means total decarbonisation, as the G7 flagged in that um, communique going into the summit. There's a ratchet mechanism, a way of tightening, strengthening the treaty, and this is the legally binding part very cleverly designed and negotiated. They all signed up to it. That is remarkable for those of us who've been following all this all these years. Finally, the, the financing of the transition. We will need trillions of dollars a year. Right now, going into clean energy, as everyone here knows, I'm sure, we're talking about 350 billion. But that has to go to a trillion and on to trillions fast. And that is captured in the treaty language and also well understood by the negotiators, which is why some of the developing countries were persuaded to sign up. And this momentum has continued, not always covered in the media, but it's continued beyond the summit. The two presidents from the two main emitters, um, you know, basically invited all the world leaders to join them in actually signing the thing on Earth Day. And 175 nations did that. No treaty in history has commanded this kind of support at signature stage. And as things stand right now, despite all the depressing talk that we hear about Trump possibly being elected in America and Brexit in the disunited kingdom, um, we are looking at the very strong possibility that this treaty will come into international law way before they even imagined in, uh, in Paris. Now, None of this could have happened without civil society. This lady, uh, Christiana Figueres, and her team at the UN orchestrated what they called a groundswell of support. Just a few flavors of that. A thousand cities at the summit committed to 100% renewable energy, some as soon as 2030. More than 50 giant corporations also committed to 100% renewable energy, some as soon as 2020. Investors lined up to put pressure on other companies to copy this target of 100% renewables. And since the summit, we've seen many examples of how this is being actually executed. So, for example, San Francisco becoming the first major American city to require solar panels. IKEA weaving its re renewables target into its business stream, um, declaring itself uh, the target of being the number one global residential solar retailer out of its stores uh, in the years ahead. Countries doing very well, Portugal's electricity, 100% from renewables for four straight days in May. Germany, uh, almost all its electricity for one day in May. And that story continues. It's, it's, it's a great drama. There are developments on almost a daily basis but it's just one of these 10 stories that all interrelate with each other. Regulators beginning to regulate. 
Much of this comes from the work of Carbon Tracker, which, as Moritz said, I have the privilege of chairing. And this was a report in um, 2011 that basically pointed out the carbon arithmetic that most of the reserves of coal, oil, and gas can't be burned if you want to have a chance of staying below two degrees. Specifically, 80% of them couldn't be burnt, or 75%, um, as you see depicted there, sorry. And this introduced a new set of language, the carbon bubble, the idea of unburnable carbon, stranded assets, the value of these reserves. Um, in 2011. Initially, when we took these arguments to the Bank of England, the regulator of the capital markets, um, they were rejected by the de then deputy governor. That's all switched around. And here, the analysts at Carbon Tracker, I can say this just as the chair of the board, I'm not one of the analysts who've done this fabulous work, um, have really got traction. Basically, uh, the regulators have been persuaded that there is real climate risk. And in September 2015, just before the summit, Mark Carney made his famous speech saying this is the greatest threat for our future. And regarding stranded assets, investors must be given the data to invest accordingly. Now, you don't need to be a rocket scientist what that to work out what that means. It means switching money out of fossil fuels and into the other stuff. This has been taken on um, by the G20 on the, uh, uh, during the summit. There was a fabulous press conference with Carney and the chair of this Financial Stability Board Task Force on climate-related financial disclosure, none other than Michael Bloomberg. And he was asked memorably, I describe this scene in the book uh, by the Financial Times correspondent, look, these governments evidently are talking about a total phase-out of fossil fuels. What does that mean for ExxonMobil? And his response was, Philip Morris banned smoking in their offices. They'd better get used to it. And this is the kind of thing that's happening in the capital markets. Other regulators, unsurprisingly, are now following. In March this year, your own regulator here in the Netherlands um, signed up to this uh, way of approaching the problem. Uh, same with the Swedish financial regulator. And this is another great drama to follow. Um, the, the sum of these dramas put together uh, makes a story that it's very difficult to take your eyes off once you're hooked on it. Disruption moving fast, and now the core reason for all these commitments, the rising carbon dioxide, that's where we go on business as usual. That's where we go to have a likely chance of two degrees. This is why people are talking about decarbonizing and phasing out fossil fuels completely. This is the challenge. And probably, uh, as Moritz said, that blue curve is going to end up steeper if we want to stay below two degrees. But it's interesting to think what uh, can be done over a few decades in technology. Let's take 40 years in Apple design. And that was their first commercial product in 1976. 40 years later, we have um, the things we're all familiar with. So 40 years in one of the major technologies for surviving the problem, solar PV. That was the cost down over the last 40 years from $100 a watt down to well under a dollar a watt. This has been the growth of the annual market in gigawatts per year. Incredible growth in the last eight years because of this cost down. Um, from two megawatts a year annual market in 1975, to more than 60 this year. Let's look at price, what's happened over 40 years of pricing. This is fossil fuels over the last 40 years. These are indices of oil, coal and gas, common indices. Solar doesn't even appear on that chart until 2006. And from 2006 to the present day, this is what it does, the average price of solar installed. So, in consequence, uh, the market has grown spectacularly. Analysts call that the terror dome uh, for two reasons. First of all, the steepness, like a fairground ride, and also it strikes terror, or ought to, into the heart of the energy incumbency. So right now, in just a few years, we've seen solar employment grow in the United States, for example, so that there are now more solar jobs than there are in the coal industry and more solar jobs in the oil and gas industry as well. 
important players looking at all this, seeing what's coming, and throwing fuel on the fire. So Apple, um, an advertising campaign from April 2014 before the summit. They want every company to copy the idea of solar farms. Why would they do that? They're a design company. Why do they like solar farms? February 2015, before the summit, we learn why. They're going to be mass producing solar charged electric vehicles uh, by 2020. That's five years from now. Unprecedented rate of bringing in products in the automobile industry. Tesla, meanwhile, are moving on from electric vehicles to energy. On the 1st of May, uh, ahead of the summit, they, they launched Tesla Energy, and that's not just residential batteries, as well as the car batteries, but industrial and commercial batteries. They're building the first gigafactory that can replicate this kind of cost down in solar uh, in batteries. And it's coming, it's six to eight years behind, but it's coming. And it's worth looking at uh, product launches in history um, to get a sense of how exciting this is. This one took a year to reach its first billion in sales. That's Viagra. Moving swiftly on. Um, this one took nine months. This is Tesla's Model S, very popular. The previous most successful one, of course, is the iPhone. And that took over six months to get to a billion dollars in sales. When Tesla launched its battery company, they had $800 million of indicative orders at the end of the first week, getting on for a billion. This is before they even launched the Model 3. So that came out on the 31st of March. They had 110,000 orders for this before people had even seen the car, before it had been unveiled, each with a $1,000 deposit and 18 months before the product can be delivered. This has never happened in the commercial world before and then a few days later they've got up to 300,000 pre-orders with queues outside Tesla stores all over the world and now it stands at well over 400,000 each with a thousand dollar deposit. That's 400 million dollars for those of you who are business people, 400 million dollars of zero interest capital for 18 months. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, and others are queuing up to join the, the fun. Um, Nissan will have a commercial, a residential product later this year. So, how fast can this grow? You know, these are unprecedented rates of, of growth and introduction of new products. And here's Richard Branson's hope. Um, on, on the back of the electric car Grand Prix racing that we're seeing now in the world. He thinks, you know, maybe in 10 years it'll all be gone. We won't be smelling um, hydrocarbons burning in the internal combustion engines any longer. And you might think that's, you know, naive uh, and so forth. But then you sort of think that it has happened before with the horse less carriage, the introduction of the car itself. Uh, in 1900 on Fifth Avenue, you wouldn't have seen one of these things. 13 years later, you would not have seen a horse-drawn carriage. So if you look at some of the figures here uh, from futurists and gurus in Silicon Valley, like Ray Kurzweil, they're really super bullish. So Ray's argument is that solar has doubled every two years. It's doubled seven times since 2000. And right now, it's only 2% of global energy. But if you double it again six more times, you get all the world's energy, not electricity, energy, just from solar. Um, and you know that would happen in 12 years if it was on the same periodicity. So this is super exciting. Not that that's a good idea. You don't want it all from solar because we've got all the other clean energy technologies and strategies and energy efficiency and yada, yada, yada. But it gives you a feel for how exciting this is and how easy it would be for people not to understand how fast this is going. Especially, I have to say, if they're men of a certain age who work in the energy incumbency. I say that as a man of a certain age who used to work in the energy incumbency. And none of this, pretty much none of this, the overlay of the information revolution, these companies that have gone from nothing to multi-billion dollar market caps using all this fancy way, all these fancy ways of manipulating and using data 
and, uh, and other um, leverage of assets. None of this really has yet hit the, the energy markets full on, and it will in the years to come. So we're living in extraordinary times where extraordinary things have happened since the summit in January. The Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi saying, you know what, citizens of Abu Dhabi, we're going to be out of oil in 50 years, and you won't be depressed about it. You'll be celebrating because of what we'll have done in the interim. And then this, on the 25th of April, the Deputy Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia um, talking about uh, a problem in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We have an addiction, he said, on television. This is dangerous. And uh, this is the moment you have to pinch yourself and really start asking, wow, how fast can this now go? And they're setting up a $2 trillion, or going to try to set up a $2 trillion investment fund to capitalize on non-oil future. That story continues what is being planned right now in companies like Google, goodness knows. So the utilities are racing hard to escape this death spiral. E.ON was the first to um, spit the dummy on the 1st of December 2014. This is a very important day. They just said, our business model is dead. We are going to go with the clean energy future. Um, the board said this to their middle management. You work out how it's going to be done, and they're still wrestling with that. GDF Suez, none of us ever expected this would happen. They were a ringleader of incumbency defense. Uh, now they're fully paid up on the other side. Much of this has to do with the fact that coal is increasingly being seen as a dead man walking. This is the Financial Times, conservative financial paper, The King is Dead. That's a headline from FT Lex column. Uh, uh, January this year, even if the climate deal slips, which it's not showing signs of doing yet, technology will bury Peabody and the other producers. And sure enough, a few days later in January, as the drama unfolds, Arch Coal, the number two US miner, goes bankrupt. Uh, on the 7th of March, JP Morgan just says it's not going to invest any longer in coal companies in the rich world. Well, how very brave of them. Watch what happens in the interim. This is the share price of Walter Energy. This is the share price of Alpha Natural as they go to bankruptcy. This is the share price of Peabody Energy, the number one miner as it goes to bankruptcy. It went to bankruptcy on the 13th of April, little more than a month after, after JP Morgan was looking for accolades for, um, for getting out of investment in coal. So little dramas like this that make you think, you know, images like this are so very 20th century. You know, how much longer can that last when you have this kind of thing going on in the investment world, especially when the divestment movement is really snowballing, and this is the famous article by Bill McKibben that spawned the divestment movement, again rooted in the Carbon Tracker report of 2011. As we went into the summit, there were 400 institutions worth 2.6 trillion that had divested from fossil fuels or pledged to. On the 4th of December, a few days into the summit, that had swelled to more than 500 institutions worth 3.4 trillion, and right across the spectrum, foundations, faith groups, pension funds, including Norway's biggest, universities, professional institutions, including the British doctors, uh, and many cities. So a movement has been energized. This is their protest in Paris, massively attended. And now the argument has morphed into something that is much more than emotion. It's also economic. So more and more studies are coming out. This is just one from March showing that had the third largest US pension fund, that's New York State's, um, been persuaded to completely divest from fossil fuels three years ago, they would have made or saved $5.3 billion. So if you don't like emotional arguments, why don't you just try financial common sense arguments? And that story is continuing, and I think will, will accelerate and move very fast. And even if people are staying invested, this is a busy diagram, but the thing I want you to note is another Carbon Tracker report. This is the amount of money, keep that in your head, $674 billion, that in the year 2012, went into CAPEX, capital expenditure, for new oil, gas.
gas and coal, mostly oil and gas. 674 billion. Let's have a look, look at what then happens. This is the share price of the oil majors um, and uh, uh, the, sorry, the oil price uh, in dollars per barrel and that's the period of real interest from 2014 onwards where the oil price drops. This is now the share price of the oil majors. Look how closely it follows it. Just one example of analyst reactions to that. Morgan Stanley, only 13 of their current capex projects are even economically realistic any longer at these oil prices and the expectation is, keep the 670 billion in mind, 400 billion of capex will be cancelled this year. So that drama is playing out as we speak, and it's playing out on a mountain of debt that we have allowed these companies to build up. The total debt of the oil and gas industry now is in excess of $3 trillion, well in excess of $3 trillion, up from $1 trillion in 2006. The bond losses, the 2.3 trillion in equity losses at the time of this slide on the 21st of March and several banks carrying loans, more than 40% of their equity. This is real recipe for disaster. Uh, but they've been able to borrow, uh, of course, all these years at um, very low interest rates. In April, we saw something remarkable. ExxonMobil lost its top credit rating. It had held that since the Depression. So even the mightiest of the oil and gas giants are in trouble. This is a headline from the BBC on the 24th of May. Exxon faces change or die moment on climate. We've seen the utilities go through their change or die moment. This uh, article was arguing that it's just one of a number arguing that this is what they now face at their shareholders' meetings. So what a drama. That, keep following that one. I personally can't take my eyes off it. It's so dramatic. The more so because of what's happening in the shale where we're actually seeing all this bankruptcy play out. Back to 2011, just before I started writing the book, this was the front cover of Time magazine, shale. You know, this is the rock that could save the world. This is the stuff they frack. This is going to be amazing. America is going to be energy independent in oil and gas, fracked from shale. And you can see why they might be optimistic. That was what US gas production had done up until that point. Well, what then happened subsequently? First of all, the early shale regions peaked, the four of them that were the early uh, mainstay and much of the production which was still growing through to 2014 was from one area, the Marcella Shale in Pennsylvania. Now what's going on here is that this rise of gas production has been achieved on a mountain of junk debt. It's not economic, they're not actually drilling this stuff and selling it above the cost that it's requiring to get it out of the ground. So back in April of 2014, and I described this drama um, uh, at some length in the book, Bloomberg journalists were already asking, is the US shale boom going bust? Now, this was a, an oil price of $108 a barrel. So don't think this is all about the low oil price. This is feasting on junk debt, another Bloomberg headline. Shale drillers feasting on junk debt to stay on treadmill at $108, where they can sell the oil to prop up the gas. What then happens is the oil price starts falling. Bloomberg again, the coming shale bust in June 2014. The US shale industry could be swallowed by its own debt. That's at, that's at $60 a barrel. Then in January this year, it goes down to 25, uh, 29. And this is when the banks start spitting the dummy. This is when the real fears emerge. Even the Wall Street Journal oil price plunge sparks bankruptcy concerns. By this time, they built up a debt mountain in excess of 350 billion. And as we stand right now, 77 oil and gas companies have gone bankrupt in America and counting. So this is a boom that is going bust in front of our eyes. The rig counts are falling, obviously, because if you're going bankrupt, you're not drilling, um, or you're trying to conserve your costs, you're not drilling. So look at that cost, uh, look at that trajectory downwards in the rig counts. So what do you think happens? We're now in 2014, that looks healthy enough, you know, US share gas um, production is rising, but they're not drilling anymore. So what happens, do you think? Peak, 
July 2015. How many people know about this and how steep is that peak going to be going down the other side um, in 2016? Another drama not to take your eyes off. And if you think, as Shell and others say, the oil price will go up again, it'll be fine. Shale will continue to be a game changer. That's what they like to say. It's a game changer. You bet it's a game changer. It's giving us it's giving a subprime mortgage revisited. Um, but, you know, this is their point. The oil price will go up again uh, and it'll be fine. They'll turn the taps on. Not according to people who are the chief executives of some of the biggest drilling companies. You can't just turn the taps back on. The kit is corroding as it stands, waiting to drill again. And your workers are going off to work somewhere else. They're sick of it. They're sick of the volatility. Front page of the Wall Street Journal, business section, 21st of April, as oil dry jobs dry up, workers turn to solar sector. It's very difficult some days to avoid schadenfreude. I have come to the conclusion. And those, of you, uh, those people tempted to think, oh, well, it, it's bound to come back. And there, there are many in Britain, in the British government, who think we're going to have a shale boom of their own should be aware that on the 25th of April, the latest rig count in the Barnett Shale in America, where it all started, was very precisely zero, not a single rig drilling there. So now we can see why people talk about the oil and gas industry facing talk of twilight. Here it is. This is, a, this is an editorial now in the Financial Times, the long twilight of the big oil companies uh, from the 27th of May, very recent. It's, Conservative financial paper, that's what they're saying. And yes, it does look a bit like subprime. This is an index of mortgage-backed securities going through the financial crisis. Details don't matter. Uh, but this is what Bloomberg's pointing out. That there's a bit of a similarity to what's happening with the crude prices. So we have worries about the capital markets and how they would stand up to this kind of shock. Um, and uh, but not just Bloomberg, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, two periods of massive credit expansion. You know, that this really is beginning to look like subprime revisited. What lessons have we learned? And again, people say, oh, but the oil price will go up, it'll help them. Will it? Financial Times again. What is yet to be tested is how keen banks and bond investors will be to finance that drilling once the oil price goes up again. And for those of you who've seen the big short, you'll be recognizing a lot of this from the subprime crisis. Short sellers are crowding in, not just to the failing oil and gas companies, but to the banks that have been lending to them in excess. So this really does smack of um, a problem. Oil companies vary in their response to this. Some of them are hedging their bets. Statoil and Total in particular. Statoil set up a renewable energy division. Total is well invested in solar and um, storage. What does Shell do? May 2015 decides to head to the Arctic. Most of the population of Seattle um, in kayaks trying to stop them from doing it. Inevitable drama playing out. You could have predicted this so easily. In September, Shell gives up, writes off $7 billion. But, you know, no good grace, no admission that they may have been wrong here. Shell continues to see imported exploration potential in the basin. Good luck in tapping that, Ben. That story continues, uh, and it's worth bearing in mind, as it does play out, that the average age of the oil industry worker now is 49. That includes all the graduates that they hire from university. 49, average retirement age is 55. That could be their biggest problem. Final story within the drama, the legal system fast becoming a driver. And here your wonderful triumph in June of this year. Nobody expected, I didn't talk to anyone who thought that this would end up in a win for the movement, but it did. It, and that win has uh, spawned talk of a global civil movement and there are lawyers sharpening their pencils all over to go at governments for um, not going fast enough. This in the context of a whole new ball game in corporate malfeasance and uh, legal response to it uh, from the Volkswagen scandal. 
Um, you know, the question in these cases always is, you know, who knew what when? We know what the chief executive knew uh, from emails released from within the company. He was informed of this problem in May 2014. They did not admit it to the US Environmental Protection Agency until September 2015. Hands in the till fraud. How is he going to talk his way out of this? That's another drama to watch. Meanwhile, uh, the US Attorneys General from four states are after ExxonMobil under securities fraud law and racketeering law, if you please, in the case of New York. Um, the US, uh, New York, sorry, Attorney General, the man the banks fear most. I, uh, I, I need no persuading that uh, Exxon is in breach of securities law having watched their antics in the period of investigation. And on the 23rd of December, just after the summit, we learned that it's not just them, it's other oil majors who have been fighting against climate change, laying down disinformation trails at, le at best. Meanwhile, engineering their infrastructure in drilling and on the coast on the assumption that they were gonna have to deal with the impacts of global warming, particularly sea level rise. So in January, this um, movement extends to the California Attorney General uh, investigating whether ExxonMobil lied about climate change risks and the founders of ExxonMobil, the family that invested, that created Standard Oil, the forerunner of, uh, of ExxonMobil, with one of the great fortunes spawned as a consequence, need no further persuasion. They have divested from ExxonMobil, the company that their forebears created, and they've done so saying they rue the morally reprehensible conduct of this company. So um, implications of this, the energy industry uh, and its executives are gonna need to be very careful from now on. This isn't just about whether we're right or wrong in an argument about climate change. This is about them staying out of jail in their dotage. And they all need to be aware of that. So that drama continues apace. I've finished. The conclusions are two. Uh, we live in fabulously exciting times, times of great opportunity. Another front page of the Financial Times, the climate battle. Um, bears early fruit as global emissions stall. Again, something that nobody predicted. But this is because of the collapse of Chinese coal production and the surge of renewables, as they say, on the 18th of March after the summit. And then finally, I haven't talked about the impacts of global warming, but I think anyone who needs persuading, just have a look at this handwritten message on the front cover of the Paris Agreement. It's President Obama's handwriting, a little message to his negotiating team. Thank you very much on behalf of future generations. You have given them a fighting chance. That's a really interesting choice of words from one of the men who is probably most briefed on climate change of anyone. A fighting chance. And that's what we have, a fighting chance of winning the carbon war. You're all involved in this vital war and uh, more strength to all your arms as we try and prevail um, in time. And thank you very much for listening to me. Thank <laughs> you.